So here's the plan. The plan is um, Lana Cook <coughs> is going to share with us briefly the website that was developed out of our work together. Then each of the fellows, and we'll each introduce them in turn before they speak, will speak for about you know six or seven minutes about a particular topic, and we'll tell you what that is. Um, uh, not so much about their research, but things that came up around um, questions related to the theme of today's symposium, effective collaborations across the disciplines. And then we'll open it up for conversation. So that's the plan. Um, and uh, first of all, Lana Cook, who is completing her doctorate in English. Um, her, uh, her topic <coughs> with us was psychedelic virality, the aesthetic contagion of altered states. Um, translate LSD. <laughs> uh, and I, mean, I just, you know, I want to pause and just say that I learned so much from participating in this, um, in this group, both in the shared readings, but from the projects, each of which was more fascinating than the other. So this one was particularly <coughs> mind blowing as it was composed. <coughs> so. Um, if you would take us through. So out of our collaboration, kind of at the midpoint, we started thinking about um, how do we leave some trace? And I really like Kathleen's words about, you know, unless you document it, it exists, if, if it never existed. That also thinking about the theme of this year, viral culture, and thinking about the kind of network and exchange of knowledge and how um, information circulates, thinking about how we would leave a trace. And in part, that's this symposium today and our conversations. But that we wanted to start to build uh, a venue to leave documentation of our fellowship group, of our research, of our talks, and to set up a sustainable site um, for the next round of fellows. So we created northeastern.edu backslash humanities fellows. This is a work in progress. Uh, here you can find out about the fellowship, the different requirements, um, and then you can check out the different projects of each of the individual fellows. So here we have in each of our pages, there's different customizable depending on you know, the fellowships, the fellows research, uh, a short description, uh, the video from their viral culture lecture. This is really important to me to have this video trace because oftentimes we have these great events, some people can attend, some cannot, and there's issues of access about both people within the university and outside the university who are very interested in these issues. I think particularly this year's theme highlighted that, viral culture, virality, right? It's a very popular issue about how many people are attending you know, each of our lectures. So to have a space where we can start a kind of scholarly, or continue rather, a scholarly conversation about virality, have this place as a resource and as a growing resource for each of our projects. And then we have bibliographies for each scholar, as well as a bibliography of our viral culture readings. Um, so under media, you can find the full-length talks. We have our individual projects, our each individual fellows' talks, as well as our um, larger Q&A. And today's symposium is being you know, reported, and that will also appear on this website as well. And so if you're curious about viral culture, you can also look at <coughs> our bibliography. This is also a work in progress, and will grow as we add new readings and um, as new research clusters appear. And then next year, we will let the Citizen <coughs> Fellows continue this project, um, and we can see this, this site grow and grow. <laughs> and um, just, and I think I'll type on this as we continue, that doing a project like this was really important for me as a, as a PhD candidate who's thinking about the, or rather pursuing an alternative academic career and rethinking about, rethinking the job market and the kinds of s skills that this entails of like building websites, creating events, that there's a lot of possibilities in the humanities if we just sort of open our minds about you know, what are those tracks and how can we um, create sort of collaborative sites like this. But I open us to the round table to talk more about the pleasures, the challenges, the pitfalls of our collaboration. <laughs> And Lana really did 
develop the website, track up everybody down, gather the materials. It's an amazing job. Amazing job, and it's a rich resource um, on the theme. Uh, so, uh, Susanna Danuta Walters um, will be the first of the fellows to present. She is um, a professor of sociology here and director of the Women's, and Gen Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program. And I must mention that you must look for her brand new book, The Tolerance Trap, How God, Genes, and Good Intentions Are Sabotaging Gay Equality. Um, Love that title. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for saying that. You too. Um, so, that's right. It was all collaboration. It was interdisciplinary. And you, oh my God, everybody. <laughs> so, uh, Susanna's going to talk to us about um, the value of interdisciplinary work and give a kind of overview of multi, trans, interdisciplinary, these, these vocabulary words. Um, and talk a little bit about the challenges of teaching interdisciplinary approaches, in particular to graduate students. Um, thank you. This was this was a great experience, um, and uh, and really we all came from such different perspectives, which is some of what I want to uh, talk about a bit. But first, I want to, um, particularly uh, coming off of uh, Kathleen's talk, uh, this notion of the difference between interdisciplinarity and collaboration and the way in which um, uh, notions of collaboration uh, might have, uh, it might be trouncing or absorbing uh, notions of interdisciplinarity. You can have collaborative enterprises that aren't at all interdisciplinary. And I think we, the assumption that, there, that collaboration means that somehow those disciplinary boundaries are being broken is, is some, one we need to be careful about, I think. Um, I also think that interdisciplinary has become um, and remains still, even though collaboration is trumping it some, I think interdisciplinarity has become a buzzword in academia. There's not really a university now, if you look on their website, that doesn't say, oh, we herald our interdisciplinary scholarship. We're at the forefront of interdisciplinary work. And um, I have a couple things to say about that besides that it's crap, you know? <laughs> Most of that doesn't happen, but I have a few things to say about that. So the first is, is that what remains, I think, mystified by that buzzword is that in fact, um, and, and this is something sort of what, what Carla was getting at, I think, earlier, actual support for interdisciplinary scholarship remains slim. Um, it really does. I mean, the actual legitimate support, whether it's in the form of joint appointments, whether it's a form of interdisciplinary programs, like the one I run, um, you know, the, the, the support for that kind of work remains, um, around, not, not particularly at Northeastern, but I think, you know, just around the country, remains very attenuated and tenuous. So I think, you know, the way in which a buzzword emerges <coughs> often uh, actually serves to occlude structural, the structural lack of resources. So I think we need to attend to that. The other is, uh, what we mean by this term, I think, is actually quite unclear. Right? And many terms, for those of us in uh, the mother of all interdisciplinary studies, women's and gender studies, uh, for those of us who, who were born and, born and bred and raised in those environments, we have been through all these debates about these terms ad nauseum. And I won't bore you with them now, but I do think we, we need to unpack them a little bit. Um, so there are, I mean, there are many terms. There's interdisciplinary, there's multidisciplinary, uh, there's cross-disciplinary, and then there's what I would call trans or post-disciplinary. Uh, and I think what we actually mean, often what we mean in the university when we talk about interdisciplinary work, is, is what I would say is the weakest version of it, which is um, multidisciplinary. It means you come from here, you come from here, you come from here, and we have some conversations or do some work in which we might learn a little bit about each other's disciplines, but the disciplines themselves remain intact. And the disciplines aren't themselves challenged. Then that's that sort of weak version of a kind of multidisciplinary, an additive version uh, of, of discipline, uh, of not discipline breaking, but the ad adding to discipline, disciplinary knowledges. Then there is, I think, a more robust version of interdisciplinarity, where, where knowledge production is made on the interstices you know, in the, in, the, in the intersecting moments of, of disciplinary logics. In interdisciplinary scholarship, 
it's not necessarily either about challenging disciplines as intellectual homes. Right? So you could have interdisciplinary work that still has an additive dimension to it and has, uh, has a place where people return to those disciplines or live in those disciplines as if they actually speak some uh, intellectual logic to them. Right? Then there's what I think uh, the, you know, a lot of critically gender studies programs, I'm going to say, do, which is what I would call trans or post disciplinary. Um, and that is a kind of work, and it's somewhat connected to what you talked about in terms of problem centered knowledge, but I would think of it as, as sort of question centered knowledge. Um, so that, that the intellectual questions you ask demand of you particular kinds of intellectual strategies for addressing them. And that, the, and that transdisciplinary work or post-disciplinary work is actively rejecting and pushing against the logic of disciplines. That's very different than models that are borrowings or models that are about intersectionality or additive models. And I think very little transdisciplinary and post-disciplinary work is being done in the academy. I think there's very little that's valued of that work. And part of it gets to, again, some of these structural questions we're talking about. How does that get valued? If we still live in departments and live in these things we call tenure homes, then the value of transdisciplinary work that actually not just works on the interstices, but actively rejects the ways in which the corralling of knowledge that goes on with disciplinary logics, where, what happens to that? Where does that go to? So I guess that's, uh, you know, my, my second point then is that what we mean by these terms needs to actually be unpacked a bit. We shouldn't just use interdisciplinary as a catch-all to talk about these vague meetings and crossovers that we need to specify more directly. And I think this came up some in our discussions. We need to specify more directly. Are we doing interdisciplinary? Are we doing multidisciplinary? Are we actively pushing against the logics of academic structures and knowledges? Right? And then I guess the third point I want to make, and, and this came up, and that's what leads me to the teaching example as well, and I think this came up in our group, is that not all of us want to work in interdisciplinary ways. <laughs> right? And not all of us have the training to do so. And again, if a buzzword comes up that says, you know, we're, you know, this, is, this is what knowledge is now, it's interdisciplinary, and in fact you don't think of yourself that way and you don't want to do that, it, it makes both the disciplinary location thinner and the interdisciplinary location thinner. Right? So that I think it would behoove us uh, to actually specify uh, more concretely how, in fact, we're invested in those kinds of projects in interdisciplinary or not ways. And I think that came up. <coughs> one of the things that, that, that my experience was in this group is I come from gender studies, which is always already interdisciplinary, if not transdisciplinary. And so my assumption of that space was just from the get-go. And I think part of what was, was different about all of us here is that there were different varying degrees of that. You know, varying degrees of commitments to that, which are fine, and varying degrees of training and engagement with those kinds of interdisciplinary uh, frameworks and ways of approaching knowledge. And I will say, I think, you know, I'm finding that this was just the, the last bit. Uh, I'm now teaching, um, I mean, all my teaching is interdisciplinary, but I'm now teaching at the Graduate Consortium uh, in, in Women's Studies here, which is a site of such interdisciplinary, if not cross-disciplinary, if not transdisciplinary logics. and. Uh, I'm teaching with two other people uh, from two other fields. The students are from every uh, imaginable back, you know, they're PhD students, but from every, you know, every university in the consortium and also every um, disciplinary background. And they know that, they are, so that this is an interdisciplinary course taught by three people who are committed to interdisciplinary studies. And I can tell you, it is like pulling teeth to get them to leave their disciplines at the door when they walk in there. And, uh, and for years of teaching, you know, graduate students in interdisciplinary studies, I'm shocked at how the young people are reproducing it. And part of it is, again, those institutional structures where they think this is what they need to do to enter into the professoriate in some way. But, you know, it is a constant pushback for me to sort of say, yeah, I really, I don't care that different political stuff. Yeah, I don't care. And you need to stop. You just need to stop. And you need to let this in, in a way that's not filtering it through your disciplinary, what you think of, what 
part of this I can use in a disciplinary way, what part of this I can use in a narrow sense. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a lesson, I mean, I think it's a lesson that it's not just happening, actually. Um, it, it's not just a top-down. The, the disciplinary logics don't just work top-down. We reproduce them. Um, we, we, we reproduce them in our everyday lives, and we reproduce them as faculty, and we reproduce them as graduate students who think that, that, that in fact, the only way to, to you know, intervene into the academy in some way is, in fact, to reproduce those, those kind of disciplinary formats. Even as, at the same time, the buzzword of interdisciplinarity is heralded as sort of the wave, of the you know, the wave of future academia. So, I don't know, is that depressing? I thought that ended on there. No, no, <laughs> it's, it's um, So, Brian Cordell is going to sort of pick up on this question of, uh, yeah, by all means, on, on reproducing um, how we the, a different way in which we reproduce disciplinarity, but what I neglected to say in my introduction to Susanna was what her topic was in the viral culture group, and that is she, um, her, her title was The Viral is Political, Sexual Identity, Sexual Violence, and Social Media. And uh, what she was working on uh, were the ways in which, um, what do you call it, like, all these ways in which we create virality in our culture, Twitter, yada, 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 YouTube, um, it, with respect to three things, the Steubenville rape case, um, the changes to legislation to rape laws in India, and the It Gets Better campaign. That ha what the phenomenon of viral culture, um, how it intersected with those three cultural phenomena, absolutely uh, fascinating. What um, Ryan Cordell, who is a, a, you know, a, a director of our new lab, um, you're not a director, what are you? I'm a core faculty. A core faculty <laughs> member of new lab, whatever. Feels <laughs> totally engaged in that. Um, a new lab for, say what it's called? The, the new lab for text maps and networks. Text maps and networks. Um, and he, uh, his theme with us was, Newspapers as a proto-internet, did media go viral 150 years before YouTube? Um, which, I, I just love this project. And what, he, what we learned about were the ways in which, in an era before copyright, um, newspaper editors were simply cutting and, and were taking uh, stories, recipes, uh, articles, from other newspapers and reprinting them in their newspapers. And now, with the availability of big data, we can track the movement of these stories, what went viral um, in the 19th century. And it was just really uh, wonderful work. Ryan is, um, is in the English department uh, here at Northeastern. His a scholarship focuses, focuses on convergences among literary, periodical, and religious culture in antebellum American mass media. And he is going to talk to us today about digital humanities and whether it's trending to become a discipline of its own. So that's the reproduction of disciplines. Yeah, so speaking of buzzwords, I'm going to talk about the digital humanities, which is the buzzword in a lot of fields right now. Um, and I should sort of preface my remarks by saying that my work is deeply interdisciplinary. The projects that I'm working on, we're working on with people in history, with computer science, with graduate students and faculty, and I'm really energized by that kind of work, which I give as a preface because my talk is going to be more about the perils and challenges of this kind of work. So. Computer processing of textual data in literary and historical <coughs> research has expanded considerably since the 1960s. In spite of the growth of such applications, however, it would seem that computerized textual research has not had a significant influence on research in humanistic disciplines, and that literature research has not been subject to the same shift in perspective that accompanied computer-assisted research in more social science-oriented disciplines. We must address the issues surrounding the general failure of our discipline to have a significant impact on the research community as a whole. So those words were written by Mark Olson, director of the Artful Project at the University of Chicago, and they were published in 1993. In 2012, so that's 20 years later, 
uh, Rafael Alvarado wrote that digital humanists have not sufficiently demonstrated to the wide community of humanists that there are essential and irreplaceable gains to be had by the application of digital tools to the project of interpreting and reinterpreting the human record. Alvarado reminded us that to a disconcertingly large number of outsiders, the digital humanities, quad humanities, remains interesting but irrelevant. This more recent claim might seem hard to countenance given the attention that the digital humanities has received of late, but that attention does not equate to mainstream acceptance of DH methods. There has certainly been an uptick in DH hiring over the last few years, including my hiring. Uh, but as a result, we often forget that the vast majority of humanities departments include no one who would identify as a digital humanities scholar. We also forget that junior faculty hired to do DH in many places face a steep challenge actually doing that work and making it legible to their colleagues at tenure time. Many colleges that are eager to get a DH person, and as a subtext, begin getting grant money, have not well considered the infrastructure that is required to do DH well. And certainly the vast majority of schools, including those actively working to build digital humanities, have not actively reshaped their tenure and promotion guidelines to reward the kinds of knowledge that DH projects often produce. Likewise, we see digital humanities sessions multiplying conferences such as the MLA and AHA, but so too does the divide between DH sessions and everything else. At the last MLA conference, 8% of the sessions at the MLA included digital humanities presentations. A significant number, certainly, but hardly a majority. In reviewing these sessions, it is striking how many of them are entirely digital humanities sessions. The 8% of the MLA that was completely devoted to the digital humanities proceeded largely outside the purview of the other 92%. Perhaps most troubling to me, however, it remains true now as it was in 1993 that scholars working in literature, history, and other humanities fields do not cite DH work. Despite decades of digital humanities projects that have claimed they will revolutionize our collective understanding of, say, 19th century American literary history, to pick my own field, a few of, our few of our colleagues outside the digital humanities refer to DH pro projects for evidence when making arguments about the period. Now, there is some evidence that this neglect is cultural rather than practical. In a 2011 article, Lisa Spiro and Jane Siegel demonstrated that many of the large-scale archives that were created during the digitization boom of the 1990s and 2000s are widely used based on the internet traffic, but they are rarely cited. Instead, scholars cite the materials from those digital archives as if they consulted the physical items. While this means that these projects are meeting their stated goals of offering wider access to rare materials, it also means that the scholars who created those resources often cannot demonstrate that impact to their colleagues, including to tenure and promotion committees. And actually, there are a number of really important archival projects that are facing defunding right now because the scholars who created them cannot actually prove that anyone uses them despite the fact that they know that lots of people use them, because people cite as if they went to the actual archive when they actually use the digital archive. Despite these explanations, I remain dissatisfied at the lingering, and I worry, widening divide between DH and the disciplines with which its practitioners identify. In a few locations, digital humanities it has become itself a discipline. King's College London, University College London have both formed separate departments of digital humanities, but I would resist such moves. I would say that DH will only be an influential interdisciplinary movement if its practitioners bring to it the methods of distinct disciplines and take insights from DH back to those disciplines. DH work will only change humanities fields if it leads to scholarship and teaching that matter to a broad range of scholars in a broad range of fields. We need outside scholars to cite our work. Not because non-digital scholars, I hate that term, I don't have a better term, I'm sorry, <laughs> must somehow authorize DH work, but because such citations would signal that DH has at last joined a larger conversation in the academy. <coughs> and people who see themselves as DHers need to work self-consciously to create conference panels and publications that bring together DH and non-DH work around disciplinary topics. We must actively seek out colleagues who don't know what we do, perhaps even those who don't like what we do, and we have to teach DH methods in a range of disciplinary classes, including literature surveys and non-DH seminars. Perhaps one day the term digital humanities will fall away, as some have predicted. 
If it falls away because DH methods have become widely accepted as possible ways among many, and I want to emphasize that, DH is not going to become the humanities. That will never happen. I hope. That would be dull. Um, but if it falls away because it's become widely accepted as a possible way to study literature, history, and other humanity subjects, this seems to me a fine outcome. But uh, before we get there, I think we have a lot of work to do. So, um, thank you. MJ Moja, uh, uh, his subject with us was Power and Puzzling, an Analysis of Offshore Wind Policy Innovation and Implementation. So here we are from a, a different field. Um, MJ is a doctoral candidate in the Law and Public Policy uh, Program. His research focuses on sustainability and governance, particularly how policymakers in emerging sectors learn from poly policy experiences elsewhere and how they apply what they learn. Um, he is uh, he's going to give us a graduate student perspective on um, being in this interdisciplinary program and the reshuffling of this program to make it more recognizable and applicable to outside institutions. MJ. Uh, thank you. Like she said, my name is MJ Mata. I'm a PhD candidate in the Law and Public Policy program. And my, my motivation um, for what I study is that when we talk about becoming sustainable as a society, when we talk about switching to renewable energy, or we talk about making things more energy efficient, so often people talk about it as if we know how to do it, as if it's a, if we convince enough, enough people, two weeks from now we can have it done. But that's not, I wish it was like that, but it's not like that. There's so many questions that are unanswered, both from a, a technical perspective, to a political perspective, to an economic perspective. It's, it's very complex, and it's so complex, I think, that the only way we figure out how to do it is if we have experiments and learn from those experiments, right? So here in the United States, uh, we, have, we have 50 states, in case anyone didn't know how many states we had. We have 50 states and we have 50 really natural laboratories. So if Massachusetts tries something, in theory, other states could learn from it, could improve their own policy outputs. And of course, you know, the opposite could happen, right? There could be a really bad policy that gets diffused all over the country. So what I'm looking at for my dissertation is Cape Wind here in Massachusetts, where Massachusetts was the first state to seek and receive federal approval for offshore wind turbines. But this was uh, about 13 years ago. So it's been a much longer process than anyone involved knew. And I think that's in many ways attributed to the fact that there's so much uncertainty. People arguing over what, what the actual questions are, and then people arguing over what the answers are. So I guess how that fits into what we're doing is Massachusetts learned how to do offshore wind policy from learning from Denmark. Denmark learned from us back in the late 80s, early 90s. So then you have other states who are learning from Massachusetts, <coughs> Rhode Island, Texas, all sorts of states working together. And so I'm looking at how the policies actually move from, from one place to another. So when you first think about it, it seems kind of viral, right? Because there's something's moving across space and time. But then you really think about it, and I don't think the viral metaphor fits what I'm doing. Because viruses, you know, usually it's when we're talking about public policy, and we're talking about people learning about public policy, there's somebody intending to learn, and there's somebody who's willing to teach. Viruses don't work like that. So I think pretty quickly I realized, you know, the word virus is not appearing in my, in my dissertation. But the practice, I think, of stretching the metaphor and trying to make it fit makes you define your own terms better. So the way I define policy diffusion is doesn't reflect the viral metaphor, but I think it's informed by it um, maybe indirectly. So I think my experience here I'm not, I don't think there'll be a humanities flavor in my dissertation, uh, but what, what there will be, I think, is an idea of how <coughs> what I'm looking at is viewed elsewhere. So is what I'm doing applicable to somebody else, to somebody outside of what I'm doing think it's interesting? So 
so many times when you're, you're, you know, when I'm in the law and public policy bubble, and you're talking to somebody, of course they're interested. They like public policy, they're studying it, it's interesting to them. But unless you talk to people outside of that discipline, you know, it's, uh, it's more difficult. So I wanted to talk just briefly about my program and kind of how it, uh, maybe some of the challenges that it faced. So in the late 70s, the Law, Policy, and Society program started here at Northeastern. Actually, one of the founders was here earlier, uh, Professor Daynard uh, from the law school. And I'm not sure if people are familiar with uh, Law and Society, but it's, uh, uh, I'm actually wrestling with whether it's interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. I think it's multi because they're doing legal analysis and sociology and they're not really doing something at the intersection of them because I'm not sure. Um, then again, you do have judges who cite statistics. I don't know. I don't know if it's inter or multi. But in any case, the program started here, and it was a law and society program, meaning people would come here, mostly lawyers, and learn how to do the society piece of it. But what happened, I think, kind of naturally, not because anybody willed it, was that it became broader than that. It became a program where if, you're, if, you can, if you can make a connection to public policy, then you can fit into the program. It was, it, uh, it was pretty, I think, amorphous. So back when I started here in 2009, there was this whole conversation about, you know, it's no longer really a law and society program. There are people doing that, but it's really a much broader public policy program that's more akin to public policy programs elsewhere than to strictly law and society programs. So we changed our name from Law, Policy, and Society to Law and Public Policy. We got rid of the society <coughs> here. I think maybe because it's kind of redundant. The, it's public policy because it involves society. If society is not there, then it's private policy. Um, but one of the problems that I think you, you face sometimes is, is there's, on one hand, a name doesn't matter, right? A name has no substance. But it does matter. Because if you're a PhD candidate in law and public policy, and you tell somebody that who isn't at Northeastern, who doesn't know, they, might, they may think you're in law school. But we're not in law school. You know, it's, so it's, it's very tough, I think, to, to explain to people what it is our, our program is. And it really gets reflected, I think, when folks from my program apply for, apply for jobs. Because there aren't, uh, we're, we're kind of a, a niche program there aren't too many like us around. So usually the jobs you're applying for are in political science, public administration, if you're a law and society person, maybe a department of sociology. So you have to, to increase your chances of getting a job, you have to, you know, kind of present almost different versions of yourself, right? So I'm, I'm a law and public policy person, but when I write this cover letter, I'm a political scientist. When I write this other cover letter, I'm talking about public administration. But I don't know nearly enough about political science. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I, a, a political science PhD student, PhD candidate, at least in theory, should know way more about political science than me, should know way more about public administration than me. But So then we're competing against people who are in those specific <coughs> students who, who have these capacities that maybe I don't or people in my uh, cohort don't. So I think that there's still, despite us dropping the name society and becoming broader, I still think there's a lot of challenges regarding how do we talk about ourselves elsewhere. Um, and I also think it's interesting because our graduate program is, can be amorphous. I think that the undergraduate minor is, is the opposite, where because we are, uh, we're in many ways, the law and uh, public policy minor is competing with political science and criminal justice for students because you know the amount of students that you get to sign up for your class and somehow somehow determines how much money you get uh, as a program. So, for example, when I teach introduction to law, I can't talk, or I can I can talk about criminal justice and criminology, but I have to do it you know off the syllabus, or if the class. I create is very different than, uh, or no, sorry, if the class I create is too similar to an introduction to American politics class, you know, then we have to kind of go back to, back to square one. So I think it, it's an interesting, uh, I think I have an interesting perspective because 
uh, I'm a graduate student, but I'm, I also teach in the undergraduate program. Um, so it's two very different challenges, I think. Great. Thank, thank you, MJ. Um, really a range, wide range of, of issues. Um, Nicole Aljo, uh, our project with us was traveling genre. It was again, different kind of virality. Um, traveling genre, virality, and the neo-slave narrative. Um, Nicole is uh, an assistant professor in the English department. Her research and teaching focuses on 18th and 19th century Black Atlantic Caribbean literatures uh, with a specialization in slave narrative. <coughs> and um, Nicole is going to talk, uh, talk about um, our disciplinary commitments and when is it best to stay close to our disciplines for the practical reasons that we talked about this morning. Um, questions about counting, um, tenure, promotion, publication, Meta discourse, and to what extent does this language matter? Nicole. Okay, so I think I should probably move this over. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my training because it has a um, it has bearing, obviously, on what I'm going to um, uh, my thinking about our disciplinary commitments. Uh, basically, my tr my BA is in art history, so my training itself has been pretty interdisciplinary. Um, and uh, visual and aesthetic culture continues to be incredibly important in terms of my teaching and my own work. Um, I don't just look at uh, text, I also look at um, you know, visual images, I consider music. Um, in the, in the um, project I'm working on now, looking at the neo-slave narrative, I'm particularly <coughs> interested in how this genre um, tr is translated by visual artists, by architects, um, arguing, and, and filmmakers. Um, so my training certainly has an impact, right, in how I look, how I want to look at um, this particular genre and how it has circulated. Um, however, um, this has been at odds with my uh, disciplinary training in English. So I, I've noticed um, over my career that although I started out in this very interdis interdisciplinary kind of position in art history, which is very interdisciplinary in terms of you're looking at history, sociology, psychology, um, right, in addition to, to material culture. Um, <coughs> But uh, oh, so um, the uh, but as I move through into moving to my master's degree in English and moving into the PhD program, uh, I've become more narrow uh, in terms of my my training. So my dissertation, when I was proposing dissertation, it was initially this very huge project uh, looking at you know uh, different media, looking at uh, text, looking at visual culture, um, these kinds of things. My advisor said that unless I wanted to spend ten years working on the dissertation, mm -hmm. that I couldn't do that. Um, and uh, I was also prohibited from looking at uh, text in translation in an English department. Um, so you see how you know, the training is getting narrower and narrower, even though my interests um, are still um, remain uh, pretty broad. So it's been sort of this um, uh, um, you know, abiding conflict that I'm having to deal with that I, um, I am naturally an indiscriminate reader. Um, I will read anything written by anyone, anywhere, my parents can tell you. Um, but uh, the discipline that I'm in, English studies, even though it has a reputation for being pretty loosey-goosey in terms of what it looks at and how it looks at things, there are still very, um, I would argue, pretty rigid requirements in terms of what your career is expected to look like if you want to get tenure, right? Um, so, uh, the, although we are encouraged by the university uh, to you know, engage in interdisciplinary you know, activities, these kinds of things, very often those kinds of activities are, you, um, uh, don't count um, in particular kinds of ways for, for tenure. Um, so, it is, it, so it becomes this um, very fraught situation where uh, junior faculty you know, are they have these desires to do this really fun, very um, interesting, very compelling kind of work, um, but at the same time, you are in this discipline um, that is encouraging you to, um, um, I don't know, suck out all the fun, right? Um, but or or, or at, at least um, make it legible uh, in a particular kind of way to your individual um, discipline. So uh, for me, uh, this this experience, and I have been in other interdis interdisciplinary groups. So this is uh, familiar, but also um, very unfamiliar, because in those interdisciplinary groups, it was interdisciplinary within the humanities 
right? Um, and so this was the first time that I was in a group where there were scientists, or as they refer to themselves, faux scientists um, <laughs> as well. So it was uh, difficult to read way outside of my discipline, but it was also incredibly exciting. Um, exciting because I could see my, uh, my project from a very different perspective. So for example, the use of the term viral, which um, like MJ, I thought it would be great um, for my topic where I'm looking at right, the movement of this genre, not only globally, um, but also across discipline, uh, across media rather. And um, as I started do, doing research and you know, readings um, from Justin particularly on, on r naught and, and how scientists actually study viruses, how viruses actually develop, um, readings from MJ about uh, diffusion in terms of social sciences and social policy, uh, readings that Ryan suggested about uh, virality web 2.0, I began to realize that virality, particularly in its contemporary iteration, um, which really is just sharing, um, sort of does not fit um, with how the slave narrative or the neo-slave narrative um, circulates, particularly because the neo-slave narrative and the historical slave narratives are connected to political and social action, right, in a way that right, sharing the I can't has cheeseburger um, website mean, right, doesn't really affect. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking, right, rethinking, um, as MJ is doing, uh, the virality metaphor. Um, I do really like, though, um, its connection to disease, uh, because it's particularly because of the way that the discourse of enslavement has been talked about, right, as a disease that needs to be eradicated. So that is useful to me, um, as well as the initial, the scientific description of the way that viruses circulate. Right? That's, all, that's, that's really useful still. Um, but that term, virality, um, it's been so contaminated um, by the Web 2.0. Uh, that um, I really do think I am going to have to you know, come up with a new metaphor or a new way of conceptualizing this. Um, so just to, to wrap things up here, I just want to say that um, you know, for, for me, interdisciplinary work has been thrilling, um, particularly because it's encouraging me to look at my project in particular from a variety of perspectives um, and to keep that open-mindedness as I move through the project. Right? Um, and uh, most importantly, it challenges uh, notions of singularity, which I think um, are too pervasive um, in the academy and um, make the possibility of one story right, uh, dominating uh, much more uh, prevalent. So I'm trying to work against that. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, our faux scientist, <laughs> a faux. Uh, Justin um, Mentoritis is an assistant professor in the Health Science Department and the director of the Biostatistics Service Center here at Northeastern. Um, his topic with us was, I mean, somebody who actually looked at viruses, uh, the application of infectious disease surveillance methodologies to humanity's data. Um, we learned a lot. Um, and uh, Justin is going to talk about what he discovered are the limitations and the challenges of collaborating across um, data-driven and humanities fields and the extent to which this was a one-way relationship of learning or a reciprocal relationship of learning and, um, and what it was like for him to be among these humanists and social scientists and take a break from his disciplinary experience. Thank you. I think that's a, um, just hearing that title of the project of what I originally said I was going to do, I think really touches upon what my expectations were. Um, so first off, um, I'm a biostatistician. And um, it's, biostatistics is probably um, the most collaborative uh, field of, sub, sub, sub field of mathematics that, um, that exists. Um, statistics itself was born at the intersection between mathematics and gambling in the 1600s, and um, biostatistics was born at the intersection of statistics and medical science. Um, as a biostatistician, uh, my training uh, was always geared towards collaboration. We try to be problem solvers. We um, seek out interesting problems that need solutions that don't have solutions. These problems are usually data-driven. Um, and the <coughs> application 
or where the data comes from is less important than if it's an interesting problem. Um, my, so I think I say that to introduce sort of what my personal biases are in terms of what I think of as collaboration and in term, as interdisciplinary research. Um, and as my old uh, dissertation advisor used to say about biostatisticians is that we are the last great generalists. We solve problems, you know, we're, we're any, any problems um, having to do with data, but more specifically having to do with data about people. Um, so when I came up, well, so my, my, my personal, when I'm the, um, there was a word that, uh, when I was a, when I, when I do my single scholar mm -hmm. activities, when I'm just sitting there pushing around numbers, my work is in infectious disease and trying to model the spread of infectious disease. Um, I've applied these to, to non-infectious diseases and to some degree of success and, and to traditional infectious diseases like tuberculosis. So when this call for viral culture came out, I thought this would be really a, a really interesting project. I, so, so I came up with this title that said, okay, let's take what I do with infectious diseases and see if we can apply these same methodologies, but instead of using biological viral data, to use cultural viral data. Um, so I believe that is multidisciplinary. <laughs> um, and so that's what I was, so, so that was, I, I wrote a very general sort of project proposal. I didn't have a, a specific problem I was working on. Um, I just sort of said, here's what I do, here's some of the projects I've done in the past. I think it would be really great to meet some people in a completely different field and see what their data looks like and see what methods they use to analyze data. And what I expected to get out of this, um, I expected to have some collaborations, to maybe um, work together on a, on a couple of papers, um, to get my hands on some different interesting data that we could use some either methods that exist or develop some new methods to analyze. And um, really, I just, I, I kind of pictured coming in, people would have all these problems and all this data, and I'd be like, oh, this is, oh, guys, we just, we, we can do this. <laughs> we can analyze all this data. Give me your data. Um, that's not really what happened. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but that was okay. Um, so was it productive in terms of what counts? Probably not as productive as as it as as I maybe thought it would be, or as it, it could be. You know, I don't think um, it's resulting in any sort of right now any grants or papers. You know, who knows what could happen in the future. But so was it was it productive in that way? Not especially. But it was. It was for me. It was productive in other ways. Um, it was a great experience of um, being able to learn in com from completely different scholars, um, and to learn uh, that there are more collaborations out there than just a biostatistician collaborating with a doctor or a nutritionist or a physical therapist or just somebody within the health sciences that there is, um, <coughs> there, there is a space for much greater and broader collaboration, um, but it, it really does sort of take a lot of time, I think. And I think um, for, for me, um, sort of getting just sort of up to speed of what everybody else was working on, and to learn sort of the different languages that people conduct research in. And I was saying earlier um, that, you know, a lot of times when um, I'm presenting work to, <coughs> or I'm talking about statistics to people from the humanities, you know, it's like, oh, you're speaking another language. Well, sometimes I would be sitting there listening to two people discuss 
sociology in the plainest of plain English, and I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. Like, I can't catch the, the references, I don't know the, the work that's sort of being cited, that's like the, 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 the cornerstone works, mm -hmm. and so I don't know the theories. I don't, and so it was really interesting to, re, to do a lot of um, the, the base reading that's up on our web, our web page to sort of get on a common terminology. And then it was also kind of fun to try and introduce some of the um, more specific and rigorous terminology that we use in statistics and in biostatistics, um, such as this, this measure that uh, Nicole mentioned, this R0 of, of sort of a measure. You know, we all talked about virality, and nobody was really wanting to define what it meant for something to go viral. And, you know, how many YouTube clicks do you need to go viral? And is there a number that one less is not viral and one more is viral? How do we say if one thing spreads more virally than another? And these were, I think, what, what I found sort of most fun about this uh, process and most interesting was sort of trying to pose some of these questions and then trying to think about um, the types of, of data that are being collected in humanities research. And some of it is the data that I thought it would be. Ryan's work, I think, is very sort of um, very data driven, right? It's digital humanities is networking. Um, and then some of it, you know, was um, much less data driven, but still concerned with these questions about virality. And, and that's a very interesting question of how do you now measure virality um, when your data don't resemble uh, typical sort of infectious data, um, like Nicole's work with the, the spread of the neo-slave narratives. Um, so, for myself, <coughs> I found one, one limitation um, that I found was when we were sort of circulating our works. Um, I, I, could, I could read Nicole's uh, manuscript, and I might not be able to give the most um, detailed critiques of it. I might not be able to say, maybe you should consider this source, or maybe you should look at this person's work who's also examined similar types of literary issues. But I could read it, and I could, under, I could understand it at a very basic level, at a very general level. Um, and I could offer some sort of critiques. And then the day came when it was like, OK, Justin, you've got to circulate a paper. And I'm looking at the papers that I have, and I'm like, I don't have a single paper that's just not like really dense with equations and theorems and things like that. And so, um, you know, I circulated a paper, and I just said, just read the introduction and just read the conclusion, and you know, give me feedback on that. And it was much more helpful than I was expecting. And um, to get feedback from outside the discipline, um, as uh, MJ sort of touched on, was really uh, useful. And to hear somebody say, you know, I'm reading all about your method, and I don't know what to call it. I'm like, oh, I never really gave it a name. Like, That's interesting. Like, I ne I've just been looking at this paper for so long, and you just miss these things. To really develop the heuristic arguments, so that it's compelling in the beginning to somebody who may not want to read through the equations, but to really lay out in plain English in an understandable language that anybody can pick this up and read what I'm trying to do. And then if that person is interested, they can go further in trying to delve into the equations. So I found that very useful. Um, and that was sort of um, something that I'll definitely take away from this is, is looking at those, those sections of the paper that aren't heavy in my discipline, that aren't the focused parts of my discipline and try and make those as broad as possible. Um, and the, the last thing to touch on is, um, you know, it was very nice to, to take a small break from, the, from my single scholar work, from my discipline, um, from staring, from thinking about numbers and, and data and, and how to analyze data and working with people to, to solve their problems, to, to, to just, get some exposure, you know, we're at this university, and 
you know, I always tell students that, you know, students, they always want to like graduate as quickly as possible. And they're like, well, if I, you know, can I, can I just like not take these classes and, take the, and just I'll be done in three years? And you're like, you're at a university, you know, you should, you're never going to have this opportunity to just learn from people. To just, this is your job. You're supposed to just learn. You're supposed to learn from different disciplines. And this was one of those sort of experiences where, like, I'm at a university. I'm not in a medical school, which is where a lot of biostatisticians live. They're in medical schools, medical departments. I'm at a university with a humanities center, with an English department, with a sociology department. It was really great to be able to take advantage of this and learn what research in different fields looks like and what research in sort of non-data driven fields look like. And um, that was, a, that was a, a really unexpected and pleasant uh, benefit of, of working in this interdisciplinary group is just to get that exposure outside. Great, thank you, Justin. Um, so uh, Lana, who you've already met, is um, going to speak uh, more um, more fully about the grad uh, gra give us a graduate student's perspective on the practicalities of interdisciplinary <coughs> approaches when she is writing a dis was writing a dissertation within a discipline and um, is confronting going on the job market in a discipline. So I'd like to start with my background, which is Nicole, because I think it really informs both my approach to my scholarship and my career. So I come from a small rural mill town in Maine, where we're a community of readers and of artists, but not necessarily scholars in the kind of disciplinary or higher education way. And how I made it from small, said, you know, small mill town um, to here was through cultural institutions, particularly uh, achievement programs like TRIO um, for Bounds, the McNair program, that really helped connect me with faculty mentors and introduce me to the kind of research practices and to the collaboration. So I've always had a kind of collaborative model um, to my education through these cultural institutions, which are continuously in danger of losing their funding. And I think part of our conversation is, is really standing up for the funding of programs like that, but also for humanity centers. And then in my undergraduate, I started with uh, as a psychologist until I had to take stats, <laughs> and I dreaded it. And I knew I could pass it. That wasn't the issue. But it made me realize how I was approaching the kind of questions I was interested in. It was the answers were not going to be found statistically, or, or that just wasn't where my passion was. And so I turned to English and philosophy of think, you know, how do I ask these same questions about human behavior and about consciousness and about identity, um, but through narrative. And that also really spoke to me in my work in undergraduate and coming from my middle community of social activism and how we use narratives to promote social justice and peace. And so as, you know, this is kind of background of a kind of multi-display, working with a lot of activists, looking, working with a lot of artists, and then coming into a graduate program where I was very much encouraged to both develop a sort of uh, a breadth of knowledge, but then also a depth. And there was this challenge of, of reining in my, you know, kind of wildly diverse <laughs> series of interests and developing an expertise in a particular area because that is the dissertation requirement. <coughs> and as my, you know, committee chair, Carla Kevlin, can attest that there was some struggle of you know, how to be on point in that kind of disciplinary sense, how to use the disciplinary language and, you know, cite the appropriate references for my field while still having this kind of interest in the larger, you know, political social stakes of a literary project. And so my graduate education has been this kind of reigning in. <laughs> and then this last year, I'm kind of coming back out and really thinking about the sort of social, political, scientific stakes of this literary work. Another kind of component, as, as I'm thinking about you know, these kind of different approaches, and I, I believe that work is always transdisciplinary. When I think about my, the community I came from, knowledge versus knowledge, I mean, it wasn't like, oh, this is your area, and that's my area. It's just, let's talk. You're interested, and I'm interested. Um, let's use our sort of vernacular language um, to kind of share you know, this information and, and solve common problems that I also became kind of curious about alternatives within the, the professional, you know, kind of career in the path. And as we hear the statistic of 
far from PhDs nearly graduating, it's daunting. But then also thinking about what does it mean for the PhD job market? What does that job market look like? Must it always be the professor in? That can there be roles for scholars and administrators? And I think humanity centers actually really show that model of you know faculty who have gone through the professoriate and then become higher ed administrat administrators. But now I'm curious about you know how do PhD students go through administration the entire time because people are really captivated by that. And I'm, I think our English department's really supported that work both with the you know English Graduate Student Association and our conference exhibits that and with the digital humanities work and building these websites and different kinds of online journals and projects, that there's a lot of interest in these multiple skill sets. And so I think a challenge of the university and the departments is thinking about how we cultivate those skills in our PhD programs, both for at the master's levels and at the PhD, that there's a diversity of career options. We need to be open to that. And it raises this conversation about what counts, you know, when I first talked about you know, doing the kind of alt-ac track, a lot of people would approach like, oh, so you're leaving academia. And I was like, nope, I wasn't planning on it. I hope to continue as a scholar, you know, but that actually like, working with this group has made me really aware of the challenges of what kinds of publication counts, what kinds of activity counts. And that for some, of, for some people, I will be perceived as you know, leaving academia, even if I'm still publishing. And so I think part of it is just reorienting, you know, how we value the work that we do. And I think that also applies to within the university, seeing the work of the daily, you know, of our administrators, that working on the website was a collaborative effort with Megan Brisson, the administrative assistant, Leslie Casey, Erica Koss, that it allowed me having an office space in the humanities center to see that daily work and to be really engaged by it. And that like, we have a lot of resources both within different disciplines, but even within the kind of working university. So I'll keep my comments brief just because I want to hear from you. Oh, that's so wonderful. Thank you, Lana. Star. Um, Sarah <coughs> Riley um, uh, had a, a tremendously important and interesting project uh, redesigning WellWatch with open source hardware to tools for environmental investigation, um, a project with um, important uh, uh, social justice goals. Um, and uh, Sarah studies and develops new modes of studying and intervening in large-scale environmental health issues. She's an, uh, an assistant professor of health sciences and sociology anthropology. Um, she, uh, her, her project, I hope she'll tell us a little bit about it, was just um, fascinating. And, but what she will talk with us about for this, for our purposes on collaboration, were the challenges of space and time, uh, schedule pressures, how do you fit in this kind of collaboration, and the rubrics and the structure of this fellowship program itself. Um, you know, why do we feel, when do we feel, why do we feel pressure to fall back into our disciplinary modes? And Sarah, you'll wrap up first, and then we'll open it up. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to, to begin by going back to something Susanna said about transdisciplinarity and how do you build a space for transdisciplinarity. And one of the things I was struck by in reading more of Kathleen's work uh, this morning was her description of the humanities as a movement. And I'm really interested in the idea of how is this forum part of a movement? How is this part of a, how is this part of a movement of building a different shape for our scholarship, of building different venues for our scholarship, and building different spaces for exchange? Um, and so I wanted to talk concretely about how this was structured and some of the pitfalls of the structure um, for actually pushing us back into our disciplines in a, almost too soon, I felt. Um, and then uh, finish up by thinking uh, again about the, this metaphor, the question of can you organize people around a metaphor? Um, and what does it mean to build uh, a movement that way? What kind of movement is embedded in this in this structure. Um, and so just to start out a bit on my work, it's been very focused on trying to build alternative infrastructures. So I actually came here from uh, co-founding a non-profit that uh, built a, a, a research and development infrastructure in the public space specifically designed to be outside of the academy but in interaction with the academy where environmental justice communities, 
um, high school science teachers, um, interested hobbyists, um, uh, people like me who are uh, anthropologists of science, could get together and redesign the tools we use to study our environment. Uh, because there are such huge gaps in our ability to study pressing environmental health questions on of climate change, of chemicals in the environment, and I firmly believe that the humanities and the social sciences has a lot to say about how we can improve our ability to capture and study these problems. And that that is about going back to narrative. It's about going back to people's everyday experience of their environments and providing a better way to collect them, to aggregate them, to bring them together and bring their shared problems to light. Um, and I came to this research through studying the oil and gas <coughs> industry, which um, when you want to, one of the things that NJ and I reflected on a lot was how our industries have built very successful viral infrastructures. They've built infrastructures that network data the world over in order to find oil and gas, um, in order to get that oil and gas for petrochemical facilities, in order to get those uh, petrochemicals into everything we're wearing, everything we're sitting on, everything we cover the walls with. Um, and that those are literally having transformative interactions with our biology. But we don't have a language for that. We actually do not have an academic um, infrastructure that's built to study um, prop a question like, what is the oil and gas <coughs> industry? Um, or how does the petrochemical industry operate? Um, and I'm very interested in how we can build an infrastructure that would turn the social sciences to helping design that so that we can better um, recognize emerging public health problems such as those posed by hydraulic fracking, um, which many of you might know is our, our, that's the subject of my research, the boom in natural gas extraction and the environmental health problems uh, attendant to uh, getting this fossil fuel resource to the surface for the people who happen to live around that extractive industry. Um, so, so getting back to the question of, of this as, as a venue, this is a space for building a movement, for building um, a new kind of academic and a new kind of academic work. One of the things that really struck me um, in, in our conversations was that we, so we, we came together, we built a great bibliography and we had excellent discussions about um, those papers. But then the, the next challenge was in part of sort of making ourselves countable, making ourselves presentable, was to, to come out and sort of turn outwards immediately back to the institution and give talks um, about our work. And for me, this presented a set of a sort of immediate challenges of, of having to integrate this work immediately back into my own work. And it turned uh, the focus uh, for me back to uh, giving a talk in a professional and, and disciplinary mode. So just, just <coughs> structural reflection um, on how our scholarship, how this structure, uh, I think, didn't necessarily always lead to transdisciplinary scholarship. You know, this sort of idea that we came in with that we would build a collaborative project or that there would be uh, forward-going uh, papers or projects that we work on together was, I think, that structure where we kind of had to turn out immediately into something that could be countable uh, to the university or viewable or, or public. Um, so I think, uh, and a couple of people have mentioned this, the need for time to develop uh, interdisciplinary literacy and that that can't be jumped over. Um, you know, you, you, you have to learn how to speak to each other before you can learn how to collaborate. Um, and so, uh, just going back to that, I just want to go through a couple of experiences that I've had in interdisciplinary work. So, my career has been interdisciplinary kind of from the beginning. I was an NSF IGERT fellow at, at MIT. And the NSF program has developed a set of, inter the IGERTs were supposed to be interdisciplinary programs um, on science topics. Um, and uh, that was, it was, turned out to be a very tricky um, collaboration. We were called the Program on Emerging Technologies, and it brought together STS people, policy people, and engineers to try and think about the shared problems produced by emerging technologies. But uh, where that collaboration kind of um, fell apart was the difficulty in deciding on a common object. Um, and so just getting back to this question of is virality or is a metaphor a good place to start a, co a, a collaboration? Um, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying it isn't, it's just that for this question, it didn't necessarily adhere. And so I wanted to reflect a bit on the nonprofit that brought me to Northeastern Public Lab, which has taken a very different 
um, mode of trying to figure out uh, a medium for collaboration, and that is of actually trying to design new approaches to research. So actually trying to design new physical objects. Um, and so our first tool that we developed was an alternative to uh, the satellite. Um, you know, a satellite comes from a Cold War mentality. You probably would never have built it if uh, the USSR and, and the USA weren't in the midst of a Cold War and wanted to be able to uh, cross each other's territories without actually having to do that physically, um, we would probably never have brought this uh, technology to light that's given us this whole new way of seeing the world as a globe um, floating out there in the inky blackness of space. Um, and so we tried to build an alternative to that satellite out of your uh, digital camera, which sounds absurd and is a little. Um, but we, so what we did was fly digital cameras attached to helium balloons um, with uh, you know an automatic finger just taping down the button, so it's taking pictures over and over again, and um, then built a piece of open source software so you could stitch those images together to make a high resolution satellite-like map. And what's very interesting about that is because the camera is traveling closer to the Earth than the satellite, you actually get more, much more high resolution imagery. And so the nonprofit that I co-founded, Public Lab, came together around that idea during the Gulf oil spill. Um, because during the Gulf spill, there was a flyover ban that prevented people from going out there and imaging this, uh, you know, massive spill of oil um, coming into ecologically sensitive wetlands and already very um, socially and economically burdened communities uh, on the Gulf Coast. Uh, so that, to me, my work is going in the direction of thinking about how can the humanities become involved and embrace the idea of critical making very similar to Ryan's, Ryan's work here. How, how do we make our work a material practice? Um, and how do we make that material practice a commentary on, um, on the sciences, on the way that we make knowledge um, and, and the kind of currency um, that, we, that we've built um, as far as how we, how we imagine knowledge in the modernist, in the modernist <coughs> sense? And, uh, and now I feel like I'm rambling a little bit. Uh, but, I guess I would just like to end on that note of how of, of how could the next generation um, of, of our group uh, be working towards thinking about themselves as a movement and thinking about um, a concrete material and shared project um, and uh, I think we've I think we've all taken really interesting steps in that direction but it'd be great to see that build um, for the next generation. Thank you all. about 15 minutes. Um, we welcome your comments, your questions. Perhaps people in the group would like to respond to one another, but I think first we'd love to hear from, from you. Kathy, I was hoping. I didn't want to impose, but I was hoping you'd have a... First, I thought... Oh, thank you. I thought I uh, mentioned Monica's work the dean of the graduate school at Columbia told me about a program which is internships for doctoral students within their university to shadow administrators, uh, department chairs, etc. People in the library, people who are deans, people who are, and he said this is just an immensely sought after and it's not expensive. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> to say, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, that's easy. I'd love to know Justin. This is not necessarily a question that's answerable, but uh, you <coughs> mentioned before Sarah about how important professional learning societies our organizations are to helping to make change. Normally they're seen as resistant. And recently the digital humanities have been rewritten in terms of rules for promotion and tenure at the Modern Language Association after 12 years. Uh, so they have been in place for 12 years and have just been rewritten, which I hope everybody will take time to look at. And then I want to come to a question. Uh, Sarah, I loved your pun, make it presentable. I thought that was lovely. I think the question of do you find a common object for study in relation to interdisciplinarity? And disciplinarity is tied up with what you were saying, Susanna, in terms of what you're encountering in the classroom, where people bring their disciplines to the classroom. 
I'm very interested in methodology. There are many methodologies in all of our disciplines, not any vocal. I'm very interested in the moment when there is an area of study emerging, a common object of study, and there is no methodology. And that, of course, was the case when women's studies emerged on the scene and many, many other things after. And so how can you make that happen again, essentially, you in the classroom when you do have now a history of methodologies? How can you make, how can you make new methodologies emerge? Or, or clear that space so that you right. are not teaching, in a sense, um, to the discipline, which is what you were saying right. you wanted not to do. Yeah, boy, I'm thinking of the answer. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how you, you know, I think part of it is, is that, of course, it's true that with, with, with women's and gender studies, you know, they, they become, and you were saying this with the age, they become entrenched in their own, you know, sort of hyperbolic, uh, methodologies and that that students bring to bring to that as an you know a sort of interdisciplinary kind of methodology. I mean, I guess part of it for me, and this is this is probably you know where I am uh, a sort of renegade sociologist speaking in that regard is actually to de to continue the process of demystifying methodologies. Um, you know, so that it's that that part of what I think the resistance I see in graduate students. Is, is a methodological resistance and it's a it's a and it's an intellectual resistance. But the methodological is that they think that they they, they have this idea of methodology um, as you know as something to do with a particular discipline that is something that's not intellectual, it's separate, right? It's a tool um, that is that is that is data driven in this way. So I think part of it is demystify is again it's a the old feminist project of you know of demystifying methodologies in that way. Yeah, what is methodology? How do you make sense <coughs> of what you're studying? The, the, the tools you use to make sense of what you're studying. So for example, if just I take issue with what you're saying that, that you know what you were dealing with, with was data and, and other stuff isn't data. I mean that's part of the problem is a fetishization of what you're doing as this is data. And what it, you know what the rest of us are doing is stuff that's other stuff that's not, you know, that's not a narrative or stories or films or, or isn't data, but we don't think of it as data because our methodologies resist that note of fetishization of it as data. So <laughs> I don't know if that, that answers some of it, but, but I think part of, part of it is, is pushing back against, continuing to push back against the fetishization of methodology and of, and of data as something that's attached to it in a particular way. Chris. Um. It's a small room. You can hear it, right? Okay, good. So I wanted to uh, thank you, first of all. It's a really, really great and interesting panel. I wanted to pick up on the, on the very last piece, um, and, but with one exception, which is at the very end you said, and I hope the next generation, and I'm just really impatient, so I want you to do something now, um, because I'm having this really weird meta experience through this whole thing of like wanting to understand what you're doing as a project, and then, and, and seeing you like shoulder to shoulder, like you seem like one being. <laughs> but everybody is saying, so my work and what I got out of this and what I'm taking from it. And so it's this sort of still feeling like a seeds to the wind kind of project in some ways. And so I'm wondering if anybody would like to speak to, um, and maybe Sarah maybe say more about, the, the whether there's a concept that maybe isn't virality, um, like critical making. I thought that was an interesting phrase, around which you could imagine yourselves um, articulating yourselves as a, a, a sort of trans or post-disciplinary project instead of the sort of you know, individual, what, what each one of us brings back or comes out of this project with. I mean, to me, I think it would have been interesting. I was, I was thinking about this this morning. Well, how would I sort of pose this? problem, would it, because I do community-based participatory research as my, my foundation, would it be interesting to have uh, people from the public pitch ideas that they think they want us to provide answers to, um, you know, I, or would you actually be picking a project like, um, uh, like redesigning the r naught equation, you know, I mean, I think, uh, or, um, 
I think you, you kind of, like with Public Lab, you kind of need a shared question. Um, and how it, and how do you get to that shared, how do you get to that shared question or shared material tool? So if it was sort of a question of how does the humanity, how would the, how does the humanities bear on endocrine disruption research? <coughs> you know, I think we could have, I, I think we would have been able to organize ourselves more um, laterally. Um, the that, the, I mean, the other thing that sort of interested me as far as how we took this metaphor is uh, I came with this metaphor thinking about viruses in terms of mutation, thinking about how viruses um, work as a, from, a, from a biological perspective, i.e. that they infect a host that they can recognize, that they have some similarity to, and that we've actually used viruses as a tool to create whole new organisms, you know, with genetic modification of, of corn, of, um, of any of our research animals is achieved through turning viruses into a tool. So I think maybe if we could have shifted our metaphor to this question of how do we make this into a tool, how do we make a metaphor into a tool uh, more concretely. Um, but I, I don't know, I see Susanna. Yeah, I have yeah, no, no, I mean, I, I, think, I think, you know, our experience, I mean, for me, some of the takeaway from this is really that not all interdisciplinary collaborations are created equal. And, and that, in fact, sometimes, you know, and we've, we've hinted at this in various ways here, you know, through this, this use of the term viral as the organizing principle. Um, you know, for some of us, that actually was our project, really directly was about virality in very, very clear ways. Others, it was more of a stretch or didn't work. I mean, I, I do think this raises the question for these kinds of projects in humanities centers is, you know, all bringing together of people doesn't work. Right? I mean, so which ones work and which ones don't work? And I think they, they can work better, uh, you know, in, 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 if it, you know, if there are uh, shared intellectual uh, interests, uh, shared political questions, shared, I think part of the problem with some of this is that actually we didn't share enough intellectually, we didn't share enough theoretically. So I think, I mean, for example, we have another group going uh, there's a wonderful program in the in the university is these collaborative research, research clusters in the humanities and uh, the humanities yeah. center, which are oriented around <coughs> you know, really around shared intellectual projects. Now we have one going on now on you know in sexual citizenship, and we actually are from quite different disciplines, but we really do share a language. We share a language. We share a conversation, um, and so I do. You know, this is where I was saying it becomes this buzzword, and we think we can throw anyone together in a variety of ways and, and make magic, you know? And, and I actually think we need to be much more thoughtful about the ways in which we imagine those collaborations happening. Uh, and, and I think there, some of the failure, you know, to the extent that some, there was some failure here, some of the failures were, were, you know, were some initial failures around thinking whether that metaphor was enough to bring together a shared discourse. Not, not, no one's fault, but I mean, <laughs> You know, so I see two Lauras, and each Laura, first Laura Green, then Laura Frater, can, can take us to the end of our, our session. But I, I just want to say that participating in both the research cluster and here, I, I don't want us to be derailed by the word collaboration. I think these different um, enterprises have different goals. And here, the principal goal, as I understood it, was to gift our faculty and graduate students with some time um, and some opportunities to be in conversation um, with other intelligent beings to, um, to do their work. And that we have very few opportunities in our college where we, we do works in progress and we do things within our departments, but very rarely do we read each other's work and comments on it. And I think that that was the overriding goal of this. <laughs> so this raises the question, actually I want to start, because I always do when I can, with a George Eliot quotation, which is very <laughs> relevant. George Eliot says, we all of us get our thoughts entangled in metaphors and we often act fatally on the strength of them. <laughs> and, which I think you oh, know, really speaks um, to yeah, some yeah. of the questions people are bringing up. I actually do think, I more and more think when I hear the word metaphor, I reach for my, you know, I mean, that, that metaphors are actually, they can make you think there are things in common or things happening that really 
art necessarily. But the main thing I wanted to say was, Laurie, I thought what you said was very, just now was very compelling because what I was thinking before was, I understand there are all these structural challenges, which it sounds like many of them were discussed in the morning when I couldn't be here. Um, but I, I loved this discussion. It sounds like the morning's discussion was really wonderful. And so there's a piece of me that wants to say, I want this to be enough. Like seven intelligent people were in, or, and I mean Justin, I think was sort of pointing at this, or, or seven, you know, were in a room together. They had what were clearly really intelligent thoughts. They came back and shared those thoughts with us. It was a really interesting discussion of kinds that we also can't always have. I mean, we really can't always take a day to sit around and, and just talk in this way. Um, but that does, it seems to me, your and Susanna's exchange does bring up the question, then why have a theme at all? Right? If we're really, I mean, if in fact what we want is to bring intelligent people together to talk about their work, see, we're not trying to produce a collaboration. And I mean, I'm on the humanities set of work, right? So I part of the, I mean, I help come up with this theme. But I think it does raise questions about is theme, by choosing a theme, are we maybe setting up expectations even in our own minds that it's actually, that we don't, that we then sort of may not live up to and then think to ourselves like, well, we didn't live up to that expectation. So that's just, because the other way, if I can say one more thing, you could come at it a completely different way, and I think Sarah was hinting at this, if what you really wanted as an outcome was collaboration, then you wouldn't ask people to suggest their own projects at all, right? You would say, Absolutely. we right. want to bring together seven people to think about space and place. And we hope that out of that, there will come two or three group, whatever. Yeah. So it seems we are, and it sounds like this was also a theme earlier, we're trying to have it, not have it both ways, but bring together a couple of things that might actually be important to us. So I think today was about collaboration, but that the this enterprise was not necessarily about, conceived to be about collaboration. And of course, Jill, George Elliott is always right, but she's also <laughs> wrong that he, in that we necessarily live by that word. So you need something, some contrivance to pull people together, whatever it is. Um, Laura and then Uta. So uh, can I just, I just yeah. want to say one thing. Um, about sort of this this idea of you know did we did we come together for a project did we produce something you know do you, I may be wrong about this but you know the original call for this fellowship um, there was no sort of and you will produce this you will produce anything and I remember on our first meeting we sort of said so what are we going to do like we're going to sit around we're going to read each other's work we're going to have discussions what are we going to are we going to produce something? And there was discussion, should we produce an article? Should we do an edited volume? Should we do a, like a, a symposium, website. a website? <laughs> and um, you know, so it was sort of like our own terms. And, I, and what I think is interesting is that we did come together around this theme, this viral culture theme. And yet what we produced essentially is a seminar about collaboration and whether or not, you know, and, and the, the pros and cons of it. And so, you know, we, you know, we, we, we didn't really produce that much about viral culture. We produced a website. <laughs> we produced a website with some resources and some, some projects. But really, like, the projects we produced haven't evolved that much since the ones we proposed. And what we really, what I really got out of it was this discussion about what interdisciplinary work is and what collaboration is. Um, as somebody who thought, you know, that I was, at the, you know, the height of collaborative research because I'm a biostatistician and I work with epidemiologists, you know, um, to, to really be short think because about I, that. Yeah, I'm okay, feeling sorry. sensitive to the time, and I do want both Laura and I to have an opportunity. I, I, I want to just bounce off what you just said because I think, um, you know, Sarah, you made a very good point in, in talking about the question of time and having the time <coughs> to actually sink one's teeth into the other disciplines and kind of learn the language, right? Um, and, and I also, I, I have another comment I want to make, but um, I want to just thank you for an absolutely fabulous panel. And, and I think that even if your research didn't change, I suspect you learned a lot from talking to each other. And it seems to me that that's a very good beginning and a very good place at which to start to think about how trans inter 
uh, cross whatever disciplinarity um, uh, and collaboration might operate, even if you're not necessarily all doing it or all totally comfortable with it. But the issue I wanted to raise was something that came up a little bit, um, not a little bit this morning, but also in, in more in this panel, and that is the question of translation. And, and it gets back to the issue of how, do, how can we read each other's work? And um, because we have to be able to read each other's work if we are going to really operate in an interdisciplinary way. And, and I think I was very struck by that, Justin, in, in, in what you said, because the, you know, the way in which other people couldn't read your paper, you, you thought they couldn't read your paper, but you could read everybody else's. And it's something that I myself have experienced time and time again when I try to read, when I try to do laboratory science. It's just, it's hard. It's really hard if you don't know the lingo, lingo or if you don't know the concept. So it's something that I think we need to think about. I don't have an answer about this, but I want to just throw that, uh, that out there. And then one final thing, um, question of audience, which is related to the question of translation. You know, who are we working for? What kind of knowledge do we want to create? And who do we want to give it to? Or who do we want to share it with, you know? And what are the, what are the problems and the questions that we want to be putting, you know, suggesting answers to, or suggesting ways of thinking about. I think those two issues, translation and audience, are really important here. I agree, and we'll let that stand at the time. All right, well, I wanted to thank you also for a really fascinating panel today, and also for thinking up the entire theme and program of this symposium. Um, I uh, just, um, Laura was involved as a board member of the um, Humanity Center, and, um, and uh, you know, as you know, I was, of course, interim dean when, um, when uh, we um, settled, oh no, we settled on this when, during my predecessor as the theme. Okay, right? yes. In any case, um, I, will, I think what, what was just said is important to keep in mind. We did not um, think of a social experiment where seven people would really closely collaborate, <laughs> but where seven people would really grow intellectually in exchange. And we did think that a theme metaphor was a good way to do that. And I have to say, um, it's very helpful to hear from you what worked and what didn't work. But I am impressed by um, what so many of you said, namely that the interactions make you more self-conscious about your own methods and um, make you think about your own intellectual history more again as well. And I think having a common theme made that more possible than if we had just thrown you, so I'm defending here. But I, I've been part of, um, of such groups where there was no common theme at all. And I will say that people can be sort of politely engaging with one another, but it seems to me that you became more self-reflexive um, than most people become in such interactions. And then something else that I don't think we can tackle now in this short period, but it seems to me also I've at least gotten with that there have been collaborations between you that have not involved all seven, but that in fact being in this group has led you in other directions within, within the ways you uh, navigate yourself, your own path as an academic, your own path at Northeastern, your own path in Boston, but perhaps beyond academia as well. And if we've succeeded with that and given you some time, then I would also say that, that, um, uh, that, that this is a, a success. At the same time, I think especially as Laurie and Tim are thinking about how to structure things next week, next year, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of experimenting. I still remember, you know, the three of us sort of saying like there should be some common readings, for example. I think giving, I mean, Laurie, obviously you've witnessed it all, but I think giving feedback on on what worked and didn't work um, is obviously so good in terms of um, helping next year's group um, be as effective as it can be that you still had to um, portray yourself to the outside world as someone with a specific project, I think that too is okay. But you did it in a context and, and the surroundings that are probably a bit different than when you go to your disciplinary meeting. And so, again, I've, I've really enjoyed what you've put together here for today. It's, it's been thank great. You. So, thank you first. Thank you, Uta, for all of your support. Thank you, everyone who stayed with us until the bitter end, which is not necessarily the bitter end. I want to just um, announce that there is a related program at 4.30 um, that will take place at 310 Renaissance Park, the Peter Burton Hansen Lecture by Marjorie Abbasin, whose topic, Laura? 
Sorry. Oh, her topic is. I'm sorry. I was. I was making an aside. Um, her topic. Her topic is poetry as a path to activism and human rights. Right. So. Um, and she herself, as I'm about to say at greater length, is uh, a seasoned activist uh, about Latin American uh, disappearances and so forth, and also the author of some eight or editor of some eighty books. So she's really. A Renaissance woman, and I hope that you'll be able to so here. If you if you have this dialogue, like, please do try to attend. It should be just wonderful. And I'd like to thank again Kathleen Woodwork, who is inspirational in every way and started this off just brilliantly this morning. Um, I want to thank the fellows, and I want to thank um, Megan Brisson for just pulling everything off always. So many thank yous. Thank you. Thank you.